Good morning and welcome to the SMU Video Archive Series. In this series, we interview members of the SMU community who can provide insight into the history of the university, especially from the perspective of their time here. I'm Jim Brooks, Provost Emeritus, and today we have with, a, with us the Honorable Bill Clements, who has played many roles in this institution, from student to board chairman. And Bill, we, we thank you for all you've done for the university, and we're looking forward to visiting with you. Good, I'm glad to be here. Now, you grew up in the shadow of the university as a small child growing up in, in uh, the Park Cities. Right. And uh, I, the, the campus looked a little different when you were uh, a lad than it does now. Very much so. You know, when I first um, was on the campus when I was about seven or eight years old flying kites, and at that time, why, old Atkins Hall and uh, da Dallas Hall were the only two buildings on the campus, and then subsequently the girls' dormitory was built, and that was that was it. You know, there yep. wasn't anything else here except uh, a lot of prairie land and Arden Forest and Arden Forest. That was a that was a uh, cook uh, hamburgers and uh, frankfurters uh, deal with a little. Uh, a uh, few fireplace that was down there. A few marshmallows thrown in? That's right, a few marshmallows <laughs> thrown in. Well, we probably ought to tell uh, many people who will watch this tape know about Arden Forest, but uh, Arden Forest is, is, was where the theology school is now, or about there. Right. And uh, was a beautiful little grove down there with a the stream Prim running. Yeah, primarily uh, boat arc trees. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And they, old native trees. That's right. And there was a little stream running through it. There certainly was, and I've caught many a crawfish in that stream. <laughs> well, uh, that must have been a, it must be interesting to you to, to look at the, think of that about the campus then and look at it now, because it's changed a little bit. It sure has. My first recollections uh, would be back in, um, oh, about 1923 uh, or four, when uh, I would have been about seven or eight years old and first started flying kites. Uh, on the campus. Well now, the legend has it that you also worked your bird dogs out on the campus. I did. There were about uh, two covey or three coveys of quail up and down that creek and uh, we had to work those bird dogs there. Well that's that's interesting. You couldn't do that now. No, of course not. <laughs> anyway, what well, you went on, you lived, uh, did, did all of your growing up in the Park Cities. I did. And went to Highland Park High School? Right, I did. And you played football there? I did. What position did you play? Well I had two positions. I primarily played the right guard, but then I also alternated at quarterback. And, and your coach came to be very important in the university sometime later, thanks to you. Well, I don't know about that, but uh, Charlie Trigg was my coach, and he had, a, he had a very outstanding career here at SMU, playing football at SMU. Yeah, yeah that's right, and went on uh, to coach high school. Oh, yeah. And, and then... Uh, and then subsequently out here under Matty Bell as an assistant, assistant coach, coach to Matty Bell at SMU. Right, right. <coughs> Uh, well now, after you graduated from Highland Park High School, right in the middle of the Depression. Uh, well, it was, it was uh, spring of 34, May of 34, yeah. and I guess that was really the, the lowest point of the Depression was yeah. that, uh, that period. From then forward, like in 35, 36, 37, the economy started turning around and uh, getting a little better, but it was sure bad in 34. <laughs> Well, and you went to work in the oil, oil fields then. I did because uh, Dad came to me right after I would uh, graduated from Hallam Park and I had several scholarships to go off to different schools and hadn't really made up my mind, although I pretty much uh, settled on uh, Kemper and had my roommate uh, picked out at, at Kemper, uh, Philip Lindsley, who I'd gone through high school with, mm -hmm. was also going up there. But uh, he came to me and he said, you know, times are really tough and uh, I'm out of work and uh, family needs your help. And so I went to Mr. R.B. Whitehead, who was the vice president and general manager for Atlantic Oil and Refining Company here in Dallas. Yeah. And I went to him and explained that I had these scholarships, but um, I couldn't accept them and I needed a job and I needed to go to work. And he said, that's fine. Uh, you can go to work on a geophysical crew uh, and uh, I got off the bus in Sinton, Texas and went to work for this contractor who was working for 
Atlantic Oil and Refining Company on a torsion balance crew. So I thought you were, might have been a jug hustler. <laughs> <laughs> well, <laughs> I, I did, I did some of that. I worked on seismograph crews too, but I started out working on torsion balance. And, and how long did you do that? Uh, 15 months. 15 months, and then you came back and I went came back and went to SMU. Yeah, and you'd had several other opportunities, as you just told us, uh, for various other institutions. How did you land on SMU? Because Charlie Trigg, who had been my high school coach, had uh, been recruited by Matty Bell, and he was assistant coach to Matty Bell here yeah. at SMU. And uh, that, that's really why I came back to SMU, was because of Charlie Trigg. Did you play football when you were back? I, I played. I played for uh, spring training and 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 uh, and freshman ball. But then um, uh, they had a handball tournament, and uh, there was a boy named Finley who was the captain of the team that that next year. Mm -hmm. And so in spring, they Matty Bell had his fa handball tournament and said, well, whoever wins the handball tournament, uh, I'll pay $5. That's the prize. And uh, Finley was the coming season co-captain for the football team, and I w met him in the finals, and I beat him. Uh, and a handball. Yeah, a handball fairly easily. And uh, then Matty Bell wouldn't pay me the $5. And I said, well, if this is your attitude, well, I, I sure I'm not going to play football for you. And so I left and went to the University of Texas. And uh, then how long were you at Texas? Two years. Two years. Yeah. And then you went back to work for oil field supply? In the, in the oil fields and went to work for them and went to work for oil well supply company, which is a, was at that time a, a subsidiary of United States Steel. Uh-huh. And uh, now, so you worked for them then? Ten for, years. Ten years. So you worked for them through World War II? Yes, I did. And we built... Um, I was in charge of what they called uh, for oil well, oil well supply company. They had a war industries division, and uh, I was the assistant manager of the oil well uh, wartime division, and we built um, uh, power plants uh, adapting oil field boilers uh, to a stationary power plant generating steam for camps all over the southwestern United States. Army camps. Army camps. Yeah. And um, I was working with the Army engineers doing this. And I, I guess we had at one time uh, somewhere between 11 and 12, 13 of those uh, installations underway at one time all, all over the southwest into New Mexico and part of Oklahoma. So you really had your plate full. Oh, yeah. I, I've never been so busy in my whole life as I was during that period. Yeah. And even <laughs> though you, you tried to enlist in the Navy and they wouldn't let you. No, I, 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 I was uh, frozen in my job. And, and that, that included being frozen in my salary. I was making less <laughs> than a buck sergeant the entire war. I just absolutely was frozen in that job. And, and that included not just the job, but the salary. salary. <laughs> uh, well, then, uh, what, the mid-40s, that was over. The war was over. And then you came back to uh, doing oil well work. That's right. And then uh, I was fortunate in having a friend named LaRue, and uh, his father said, well, you know, uh, you, what you ought to be doing is a drilling contracting business. And I said, well, I've done a lot of work in the oil field, and I've, my background is engineering it was at SMU, and I'd like to do that. And so uh, I.P. LaRue and Todd Lee Wynn, who was his best man for in his wedding, well, Ike LaRue and Todd Lee Wynn, uh, helped me to get started and owned half the company. And uh, we were started out with two used drilling rigs in South Texas, and uh, that, that was the beginning of SEDCO. SEDCO, Southeast Drilling Company, Southeastern SEDCO. Drilling Company, and the, the acronym was SEDCO. SEDCO. That's right, and that ultimately was the name by which you were listed on the stock exchange. On New York Stock Exchange, that's, that's right. right, as SEDCO. Right. And... Uh, <coughs> So you built Sedco from scratch. From, from scratch with two used drilling rigs, 
and you were working primarily in the southwest at that point in time. Yeah, and then ultimately went Gulf into Coast. Louisiana and Mississippi. Yeah, yeah. And then I went overseas. Because uh, I know you had big operations in the Persian Gulf area. We At one time we had um, 21 rigs working in the Persian Gulf area in uh, all the uh, uh, Emirates and then also in Saudi Arabia and Iraq and, and, and in Iran. Mm. Um, and and you, were, you operated effectively, you operated SEDCO until uh, you really moved to Washington. That's really right. Yeah. That's true. But uh, sometime along, what, about 1960, you, you came back to SMU as a trustee and, and Board of Governors member? Willis, uh, Willis talked to me about it and um, asked if I would, um, if I'd do that. And, um, and at that time, I, I first became a trustee and then they organized the, the executive committee of the Board of Trustees into what they call the Board of Governors. Right. And uh, he asked me to move over there, which I did. And uh, I succeeded uh, Gene McIlvaney as the chairman, chairman of the Board of Governors and did that then for many years. Yeah, because you were, you were chairman of the board from, what was it, about 1960 until 72 that you went to Washington? That's right. Late, late 72 or 70, early yeah, 73. Yeah, and spent my time up there four years, and then when I came back to Dallas, well, they asked me to come back, and Bob Stewart had taken over from me, Right. and he resigned, and uh, I took his place again. So I had two terms in as chairman of the Board of Governors. Right, and, and you served then in that position the second time until you ran for governor of the state. That's in right. In 78? Yes. Yeah, and, and then you were out for four years and then you came back to the board. They asked me to come back and I, I, I agreed to do that. And uh, then I, I don't want to get into all those I know, details. I'm not, I'm, I'm, not, I'm not leading you into they, it at all. They, they asked me to come back under, um, under uh, not too favorable circumstances, which I had had nothing whatsoever to do with. And that was a difficult time. Yeah, yeah, for, it certainly must have been. Um, well, let's, let's talk about, uh, you know, you have, uh, you contributed a lot. Anybody who's on the board uh, and is active on the board in any institution is going to contribute to it, and you certainly have done more than your share here. But in addition to that, you've done a bunch of other things. Um, the first place I think that, that your name popped up was on Clements Hall. Yes. And uh, that was, used to be Atkins Hall. Right. And the university had built new dormitories because Atkins Hall was a men's dormitory. Yeah. And uh, so the university built new dormitories and needed, the faculty was expanding, the student body was expanding, we needed a classroom building and you made it possible to convert Atkins Hall <laughs> to that purpose. Willis, Willis uh, had this idea and um, came before the board at that time and said, I'd like to permission for you to uh, change the direction for Atkins Hall and uh, instead of making it a, in a as, using it as a dormitory to change it in into an administration building. But um, to make that change and to re rehabilitate it, so to speak, uh, it's going to, and I've had an estimate. To, he tell us, and we, he told the board, I've had an estimate made, and it's going to be six hundred thousand dollars. And uh, I'm concerned about where I'm going to get the six hundred thousand dollars. And there was a long silence on the, on the board, <laughs> and, and uh, there were a few questions asked about, you know, how long it's going to take, and so forth and so on, and. And then I spoke up, and I, I, I knew we weren't getting anywhere. It wasn't, any, wasn't, wasn't anybody on the board being responsive. <laughs> and so I said, well, Willis, I'll, I'll take care of it. And so that, that's really the first major thing that I did for, for SMU's campus was to rehabilitate Atkins Hall. And that is still a very functional building that serves the purpose. It's a, it's a beautiful old building. Yeah, it is. Yeah. It is. And, uh, that was the second building built on the campus. That's right. That's right, after Dallas Hall. After Dallas Hall. That was the first building that was built after Dallas right. Hall. Right. So it goes back to almost to, what, 1912, 1913, along yeah. in there someplace? Yeah. Um, well, then, 
someplace along here uh, in this period of time, you also got interested in, in a piece of property in New Mexico that the university was in the process of, of joining up with. And we're talking about Fort Bergwin. Mm -hmm. And what I know about Fort Bergwin was that uh, initially it, <coughs> it was, it was uh, owned by uh, Wichita, Kansas lumberman, Ralph Rounds, and then he conveyed one, one piece of a larger tract to the Fort Bergwin Research Foundation. And about that time, I think, is when you began to get interested in it, maybe a little bit later. Well, what, what really happened there was that um, uh, I became interested in New Mexico. And uh, this Fort Bergwin situation, uh, they had a uh, barbecue lunch out there and I was chairman of the Board of Governors and they were they had gone to different institutions trying to dispose of it and no one was interested whether it was in Kansas or in New Mexico or whatever they had offered it to Texas Tech and they'd gone they'd gone the whole round shopped it shopping it yeah and and no one wanted to undertake it and uh, I heard about all this and so I asked Willis if, he wanted, if he'd go out there with me. So he, oh, I had a plane at that time, and so I loaded Willis up, and off we went, and we inspected what was then at Fort Bergwin and uh, talked about what its, what its possibilities might be. And that was a partially reconstructed uh, restoration of the old original fort. The old original fort. Yeah. And that, 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 that original old building is a... Is a uh, staked out old fort that's still there. Right. And that was the only building that was on the campus. It was that one building with that little quadrangle right. inside. And the all. parade ground, so-called. Yeah, right. And um, so we looked at it over and I said, you know, Willis, I think this has great possibilities for an SMU summer school. And he, I don't know, I, I don't know, I, let me think about this. <laughs> and he thought about it and and I, I brought it before the board and, and, um, and we finally decided that we'd go ahead and do it uh, with me buying it and giving the money and uh, that's how we started Fort Bergwin. Uh, and Fred Wendorf of course, of course. He, he was, was instrumental in, in the whole thing. You know, he had tried to shop that deal. <laughs> <laughs> he had gone around to, to the Texas Tech and different institutions and University of New Mexico and so forth, trying to shop that idea, yeah. and uh, it uh, it wasn't going anywhere. And finally, uh, we got together, and he hit a, a sensitive note with me, and so I said, <laughs> "Okay, we'll do it." And of course, uh, Fred Wendorf's association with SMU is another interesting story that uh, really involves moving a whole department from the State Museum of New Mexico to SMU which was pulled off by Claude Albritton when he was dean. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and that, that really married the two things, the department and, and the Fort Bergwin project. Yeah. I think it's been good for SMU and it's given them a, uh, an arrow in their quiver, so to speak, that uh, is unique uh, so far as universities are concerned to have that facility uh, out there with, in a completely different environment and it's a wonderful thing for the students here on the campus. Yeah, no doubt about it. And it's a wonderful place for uh, research in anthropology and archaeology and geology particularly. Yeah. Uh, well now, actually that original tract of land, I've forgotten how many acres was involved, but there were some more pieces of land that Mr. There, Rounds owned. There were. And ultimately we ended up acquiring most if not all of that. Well, when you say we, yes, I, I collective, collectively, because uh, exactly. I, I was still then uh, chairman of the board, and um, we ne we needed those extra pieces of property, and I made a trip to Kansas, and uh, met with the board up there and the Rounds family, and uh, they were tough traders. They they weren't giving anything to SMU, and so I bought that property from the Rounds and for the benefit of SMU. Mm -hmm. And uh, that was what, 375 acres? Something, something like that, yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Uh, and so um, some of that was trust land for Rounds children and so it on. It was. Yeah. And, and, and they had to agree to it. Yeah, yeah. 
of course. They I, would have I, to met, I met with them, made yeah. a special trip to, to Wichita, Kansas, and, and, and met with them. I mentioned that because that made the, made the transaction even more complicated in it terms did. Of, of negotiating it and getting it all set up. That's right. Um, so for a while, we weren't sure we were going to be able to do it. Exactly. And, and that all took place in what, in the late 60s, I want to say. Is that about right? Uh, I, I'd say 67. Yeah, sometime. roughly. Yeah, and then the next the next step, and and you may plug in some other points in between. But you and and Fred had been talking about the development of the campus right out there, and uh, we had to because uh, we didn't have any facilities. Of course, of course, because the first time we had a geology summer field course out there, it was in the old schoolhouse, and right. which was about to fall down and had rattlesnakes living underneath it. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> and uh, we decided that we needed to do better than that. <laughs> in any event, um, uh, in, I believe, in October of 72, you loaded Fred and me and a couple of other people on your plane, and we went out there to identify sites for 10 casitas, residence halls. That's true. And a dining hall. I remember it well. Yeah, it was a beautiful October day, and the next, the, about two days later, they had 10 inches of snow out there. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> uh, but that was a major piece, and those buildings were built then the next summer, in the summer of 73, and dedicated in 74. And you, by that time, you were uh, Deputy Secretary of, Ener of uh, Defense. Defense. And you flew out for the dedication. I did. That's right. And received an honorary degree I did. on the campus. That's the right. only one I'm, that I know of that has been given off campus. I, I was very honored to, to receive it. Well, and I cherish the idea that, you know, as a, as a sorry engineering student, I'm, <laughs> I'm, I'm now a doctor at SMU. Absolutely. Well, we're, <laughs> we're glad to claim you. <laughs> Well, then after the, the casitas and the dining hall were built and we got the program up and running, that is we the university collectively, um, the, the next, and I may be off in my sequence of buildings here, but I think the next buildings built were um, the hospital and surgeon's quarters, which you helped with. Uh, that was a restoration of the old hospital and surgeon's quarters that we restored as an archaeology research building. Yeah, I don't think there was much re restoration that went into. No, no, that. no. I, I misspoke. It was built on the on the posts that were still in the ground. That's exactly right. Yeah, that's yeah. A, that's a new building. It is. Yeah, it's new. It's what twenty years old, probably. Yeah, that, right. Something like that. <clears throat> and at at the same time we were doing that, and I was directly involved at that point with running Fort Bergwin, uh, and you helped also. You you made possible all of this. The, the construction of a house that w didn't have anything to do with the authentic fort, but it was very important to have on the grounds, which was for the caretaker. Right. Because we needed a full-time presence there, and they needed to have a comfortable place to live. Exactly. And uh, that house has worked out very, very well. And that would have been, I think, in the early 80s. Is that about right? I, I don't remember, Jim. It would it'd be somewhere around that point, maybe, maybe late. 70s, but yeah. early 80s, yeah, something, yeah, something that like time that. time frame. Yeah. And then at, at some point, about the same time, we built those three faculty duplexes. Yes. Uh, on between, between the fort and the, uh, and the residential campus, if I can call it that. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, and that were, those were good investments, too, because they really made possible getting faculty to come out there and live comfortably while they were teaching or doing research. Well, we, we, uh, we made some basic decisions there. First of all, we, we built duplexes. Right. And, and that was a good decision. Instead of having single family deals, we had duplexes. It was inconvenient for some of the faculty, of course, particularly with children and all. Yeah. But uh, from a standpoint of economics, that was the obvious right answer for us to build those duplexes. And uh, that, that caused uh, a lot of discussion before we decided on exactly how to do that. Yeah, I remember some of those discussions. <laughs> That's right. And, but that was the right decision, and, and they were well placed where we put them. Well, I was going to say that, that uh, you and 
I guess uh, I, I think Bill Hutchison may have been over, had come, and over, come over from his place east of uh, the mountains. <coughs> uh, but we walked the ground and sighted those things, and you were exactly right. Your instinct about where to put them was exactly right because yeah. they're accessible in both directions, That's to the right. fort and to the residential campus. And to the creek. And to the creek because the creek runs right by them. Right. And uh, so that, that was a, a very, very good set of decisions. Well, then the arts building and, and a laundry were built. And the laundry is one of those functional buildings. This is after I was out of the scene, so I can say that it, that was a mistake I made. I didn't recognize that, that people didn't any longer use washboards and tubs to do their laundry. And uh, kids were having to drive into town. And that was a, a dangerous drive that they didn't need to make if they didn't have to. I was happy to build that laundry. I, it was something that the campus needed. Yeah. And it made a lot of sense. No, oh, it did. And um, the arts building, the performing arts building, is a great asset too. Well, we have Edith and Peter to thank for that. That's right. That was uh, an anonymous donor. Yeah. Um, and then finally, and uh, one of the one of the nicest additions to the campus out there is a, a building that was dedicated last summer, sure. the summer of two thousand four. I like it. Uh, and that is the library building right. that is that is dedicated to Fred Wendorf. Yes, and it takes the place of another building that faces on the the parade ground at the fort. It mm -hmm. was built on the again on the base of of the the post that had rotted off that was the were the original building. Uh, anyway, uh, Fort Bergwin. I think those of us who have worked with it and had the opportunity to work with you on it. We recognize that it already is and a great asset to the university and has the potential to be an even greater one. And uh, so that, that, is a, that is a huge contribution that you made. Well, Jim, you know, uh, sometimes you make a decision that, that um, you don't know quite why you make it. Uh, you're not really qualified to make it. But uh, that was a great decision to, to go out there. And uh, it's a shared decision because without Willis's concurrence, uh, it certainly wouldn't have happened. But uh, Willis also had the, the vision that, uh, that uh, a, a, a good summer school in a completely different environment could make a real difference to SMU's campus, that there would be enough students that would take advantage of that sort of a facility, that um, it would be a success. And that, would, that was his judgment. And without his judgment about the thing, why it would never would have happened. I was perfectly willing to do it. I thought it was a great idea, because I'm, I'm an old camper and raised under the auspices of Camp Wisdom with the Boy Scouts and so forth. And I thought this would be a great facility, but that's not shared by everybody. <laughs> but but Willis was in the position of saying, "Yes, let's do it. That's fine. I'd like to. I'd like to do that." So we did it. And you know, all of us from time to time make decisions. And even though in our gut we know that they're the right decision, there are times when we wonder why we did that. And Willis had a few of those moments along the way. <laughs> he used to refer to this as Wendorf's alligator farm. <laughs> <laughs> well, oh, oh, when Wendorf. You know, he he, uh, he he shopped that thing all over the Southwest. I know. And, he did. and we were we were like a poor fourth or fifth choice for that. <laughs> that he finally arrived at on our campus, and and he got, had someone that would listen to him, and <laughs> yeah. and so we he finally made a sale. But it, it wasn't an easy sale. <laughs> no. That was shopped all around the Southwest. <laughs> well, in any event, we have it now, thanks to you. And, uh, and we're grateful. I think it's, it's working its way through. Let me just ask you before we move on to other topics, uh, in your view, what are the most significant future needs, directions that Fort Bergwin ought to be looking at? Um, Jim, I, I, I'd say that two things, at least in my judgment. And one is more participation by SMU students, number one, and a higher quality student of SMU. In other words, uh, it should be a, a, a goal for uh, top students, uh, which it is not now. 
and it should be so attractive that it, its its quota, its ability to take care of the students and house them and so forth and all, that um, uh, it's limited to really SMU students. And this idea of uh, outside recruitment and people who are students who have no connection with SMU and never will have and everything, I, I'd sure like to see that change. Mm -hmm. And it, ha it has to do with a, a selling program. Uh, I guess it really starts with the administration and from the administration to the faculty. And the faculty is a big factor in this. Yes. And then from the faculty to the students. But to get to the students, it's going to take from SMU an absolute commitment by the administration, first of all, then by the faculty in a complete sense of cooperation and solicitation and recruitment and into the students. But it has to do that, and it hadn't been in the past. Well, you're exactly right, because the courses that do not make out there that are offered but don't fill with students, almost invariably uh, you can trace to the fact that a faculty member wasn't saying, I want you to come to Fort Bergwin next summer. There's something you need to do out there. Exactly. And, and that's just something we collectively have got to work on. Right. All right, well, let's move on because um, more recently you've done something right here on campus that I think is a model for other departments uh, as they look to the future. And this is your endowment of the d history department and the creation of the Clements Center for Southwest Studies. Now, I know because I've seen parts of your library, you've got a, a large personal library and dealing with Southwestern history. About 8,500 volumes. Yeah. When did you start collecting those? When I was uh, still in high school. And uh, my mother is the one that um, really moved me in that direction. And it had to do with historical books and primarily Texas history. And so I started accumulating that uh, library when I was still really uh, in, uh, in high school. And um, that's really the roots of your, your interest in, in, in history and the south, history of the Southwest. No question about it. Yeah. Right. Um, well, now, uh, you know, the, the Clement Center has really <coughs> begun to build a very interesting and exciting program. Um, what are some of the accomplishments that they've made that, that you've been particularly pleased with or interested in? Well, I think probably the recruitment of, um, of the students. They've, um, they have used part of that endowment and everything for scholarships yeah. and, and uh, recruiting outstanding students around the country and everything. And I, I have not recently, but uh, through the years, I've met with them uh, for lunches and things like that to meet these students that have come in from outside that have been recruited as as top students from around the right, country. Right. And um, I'm really impressed with the graduate students that, that have been brought in, mm -hmm. which uh, was really not part of my uh, original idea. I was thinking of undergraduates yeah. more than I was the graduates. But those graduate students have written books and uh, have right. done research and so forth, That is, some of which is really outstanding. Yeah, and it's been published, and uh, when you have a cadre of graduate students like that and the faculty that goes with them, then you, you begin to attract the undergraduate students, so yeah. it all fits together. Yeah. Um, are there any other aspects of, of the Clement Center or the History Department that, that uh, you have any particular comments about that uh, have been interesting to you or? No, I really that, don't, Jim. I think. I think that they have um, tended to their knitting, so to speak, and in recruiting these students. And um, and um, I'm I'm glad to see the, an emphasis on the graduate students as opposed to undergraduates. And uh, that uh, that seems to me to to provide more meat on the bone, so to speak, when they have ma already made a decision, I want to do this as a, as a graduate program. Uh, That's right, program. As, a, as a probable life career. Yeah, right. Yeah. And so I, I think the program's doing very well. Good, good. Um, 
Well, additionally, uh, there are a couple of other things. Uh, and this would have been, I think, in the 70s, you gave an endowed professorship in applied mathematics in memory of your sister. Right. And the Betty Clements professorship. Yeah. And she was a math teacher in high school? or Yes. And um, uh, Betty was a, was a great admirer of Dr. Muzan. And that, that's how that uh, emphasis on uh, math mm -hmm. uh, really got underway. Of course, she was... Uh, a good math student in high school at Helen Park High School, but uh, Dr. Muzan is really the one that pointed her in the direction that uh, she went as a teacher and uh, working on her doctorate and so forth and so on. Uh, and he was, for many years, was the chairman of the math department right. at SMU. Yes. In addition to being the uh, chairman of the faculty athletic committee and our representative in the Southwest Conference right. uh, Athletic Council. Uh, I'd, I'd not known that background, and that's interesting to have in the record. Well, now, later on, uh, after you were pretty well finished with your public service, you came back um, and uh, you had mentioned earlier in our conversation that Charlie Trigg was your football coach in high school. Oh, yeah. Briefly in uh, this. Uh, and SMU. counselor at camp and that sort of thing. Yeah. yeah down at Camp Stewart. And I'm sure you played an instrumental role in talking with Charlie and his wife, Kitty, uh, about the new student center, what was a new student center 20 years ago. Right. Uh, do you, are you comfortable talking about that a little bit? Well, uh, now they were, we should say, they were in San Angelo. They were. And, and had course, an automobile agency. That's right. Um, of course, Kitty was from San Angelo, and um, Charlie, uh, when he got through all of his coaching activities and so forth, why uh, he wanted to go back to San Angelo because of Kitty and her family who had ranching properties there and, and lots of kin folks there too. And so that's how they ended up in San Angelo because that's an old family that was there and mm -hmm. been there for a long time. And um, Charlie, you know, I'd go out there and visit him. I'd go out there, you know, maybe uh, once a year or something like that and spend a weekend with him. Mm -hmm. And then uh, when I was governor, why well, he and Kitty would come down and stay with me at the mansion and have dinner at the mansion and that sort of thing. So our relationship continued through the years and um, uh, they, were, they were an outstanding couple and I had as much affection really for Kitty as I did for, for Charlie. I, uh -huh. they, were, they were a fine couple. And of course, they didn't have any children, and uh, they used to joke and say that I was their adopted child, <laughs> which I, know, of course, wasn't. Uh, no, but it was a nice compliment. Yes. Uh -huh. And and am I remembering? Uh, someone told me at the time that the building was being the Hughes Trigg Center was being built. That that they used to there was a, a bench over there that they used to court on when they were students here. <laughs> yes, that's true. That's true. <laughs> Well, that's a nice legend, whether it's true or not. Yeah. <laughs> um, well, uh, let's let's take a minute. Um, you you have really uh, you've been involved with SMU uh, for over a span of years, as as we've said. And um, what are you? Do you have any feelings about what the the university has accomplished since? you've been in a position to observe it and maybe what what remains to be done <coughs> well Jim I've, I've watched uh, SMU evolve uh, over a long period of time and one of the things that uh, has impressed me is that that um, the governances at SMU through the Board of Governors and um, and, uh, and of course the faculty too, they play a role in that. But uh, they're open, they, uh, they're open-minded, they're uh, uh, subject to change, uh, they're, they're, they want to move ahead, uh, they want to constantly increase uh, quality, um, they're not interested in 
the numbers as far as the student body is concerned, and and uh, I'm not sure that it's in the in the minutes, but um, uh, a magical figure of like 10,000 full-time equivalents uh, has always been kind of the the guideline. The, the guideline. Yeah. And uh, that's good. And SMU should not think in terms of uh, quantity, they should think in terms of quality. And uh, work into a guideline of a uh, uh, full-time equivalent 10,000 uh, student body, uh, including the, the, the graduate students and all, uh, that's, a, that's an appropriate uh, area. Because among other things, um, the campus is only so big. That's and, right. And, and if we think about expanding very much, it's going to be terribly expensive. And I don't think it's cost effective. I don't, well, it's not cost effective in many ways. It's not, uh, it's not educational effective That's either. That's right. That's right. I mean, there's just so many quality faculty, as an example, that you can actually recruit and bring to SMU's campus. And, and you start trying to be a, another University of Texas with 50,000 students and all, that's crazy. Yeah. And we, we at SMU don't want to do that. I think my judgment and observing what, what, you're, what you've said over the years, and this is a very consistent message that as long as I've known you, you've been saying the same thing. That's that absolutely point. right. And uh, you, you're building for not increasing quantity, you're building for increasing quantity. Quality. Uh, quality. 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 That's quantity. absolutely not, right. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so aside from that, are there any things specifically that look into the future that you would like to see done or that you think directions you'd like to see the university take? Jim, I, you know, um, being, being the, um, what I would call indifferent or average student that I was, it almost seems ridiculous for me to talk in terms of quality of the students. But if I, if I were active at SMU, I'd be harping constantly on increasing the quality of the students and in turn, the quality of the faculty. And uh, for either one of these uh, situations to get static is no good. And uh, uh, I say that in, in particular to the faculty. And that, that takes a lot of discipline by the administration to really police and to look after and instill the proper discipline into the selection of and the retaining of uh, good faculty. Yeah, and, and that's right, and that requires an interaction with the, the senior leadership of the faculty who are selecting the junior Absolutely. Board. The whole yeah. thing has got to work together. That's right. Uh, in, a, in a very tight fashion, and that's exactly what you're saying. That's right. And you've said it as long as I've known you. <laughs> that's right. <laughs> and uh, <clears throat> we appreciate all you've done, and uh, I thank, and we thank you for taking time to come in this morning and have a chat. It's my pleasure, Jim. Bill, good. it's a pleasure. You Always betcha. good to be with you. All right, thank you.